Section 1 of Piloting Directions for Gulf of Finland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Piloting Directions for the Gulf of Finland. Compiled chiefly from the Swedish and Russian surveys, particularly those of Monsieur Gustav Klint and General Els Pafariov considerably improved by the remarks and observations of several experienced pilots, masters in the Navy, and commanders in the Baltic trade, with accurate descriptions of the new lighthouses, beacons, etc., originally compiled by J. W. Nori, hydrographer, author of a complete epitome of practical navigation, set of linear tables, stars, etc., etc. London printed for and published by Charles Wilson, late J. W. Nori and Wilson, chart seller to the Admiralty, the Honorable East India Company, and Corporation of Trinity House, at the Navigation Warehouse and Naval Academy, number 157 Leadenhall Street, near the Royal Exchange, where may be had pilots, charts, and all the publications of Steel and Company, late of Tower Hill and Cornhill, 1845. Piloting Directions for the Gulf of Finland Note, throughout the whole of this work the bearings are magnetic, or by compass, and the soundings those taken at low water. The variation about Uttöa and the northwestern part of the gulf is 15 degrees west, at Åbo 14 degrees, Hangar Head 13 degrees, near Porkkala 12 degrees, at Orenground 10 degrees, at Tobokin 8 degrees, and at St. Petersburg, 7 and 1 quarter degrees. On the south side of the gulf, at Dagerert, 13 degrees, Udensholm, 12 degrees, Revel, 11 degrees, 30 minutes, Ekholm, 11 degrees, and Narva Road, 9 degrees. Description of the towns, etc., in the Gulf of Finland. The Gulf of Finland is a spacious and extensive arm of the sea, stretching from the northern part of the Baltic to the eastward, as far as St. Petersburg. Its northern boundary may be considered to commence at Hangar Head, and its southern limits at Dagerert being about 19 leagues apart. In some places in the eastern part it is full 20 leagues across, but as you approach the channel leading to St. Petersburg it becomes narrow, its length from Hangar Head to St. Petersburg is computed at 73 leagues. Numerous islands and shoals are scattered about this gulf, which hitherto have made its navigation extremely hazardous. But these are now most excellently rendered safe and conspicuous by lighthouses, beacons and flanks. These latter are commonly either white or red, and are supported by high wooden crosses. The greatest attention is paid to keep them in repair, and galliots are constantly employed to superintend them during the time the gulf is navigable. The white flags are placed on the northern end of the respective shoals, the red flags on their southern extremities, and the lights continue to burn until the winter sets in, which happens generally at the latter end of October or the beginning of November. Thus the port of Riga in the Baltic is commonly closed with ice in October or November, and opened again in March or April. Habsal, Rogervik, or Port Baltic, Revel, and those to the eastward, close in November or December, and open again in February or March, while Narva, St. Petersburg, Viburi, and Friedrichshaven close in October and November, and all open again in April, except St. Petersburg, which frequently is not freed from the ice until the month of May. The whole of the shores north and south of the Gulf of Finland is now included in the Russian territory, and the southern coast is under the jurisdiction of the two governments of Rivel and St. Petersburg, that of the northern of Karelia and Nybury. The government of Rivel contains the harbors of Worms Road, Habsel, Rogervik or Port Baltic, Rivel, Kolkavik, Paponvik, Monkvik, Kaspervik, Kunda and Narva. The principal of these are Revel and Port Baltic. 
Worms Road or Deep Haven is situated between the northeastern part of Dagoe Island and Worms Island and affords good and spacious anchorage. In wartime it was found to be a very convenient station having an extent of six or seven miles and a depth of water from six to twelve fathoms. Habsal or Habsal is calculated only for small vessels. Its entrances are through the Worms Road and to the southward of Worms Island, or between Worms and Nuukkö, there is also a passage to it from the Baltic through Sele Sound, and also from the Gulf of Livonia by Moon Island channels, but this is a place little frequented, except by the natives with small craft. Port Baltic, or Rogervik, is a good place of refuge, according ample shelter in case of necessity. There is a lighthouse at Pakirort to direct you to its entrance, and the town and fort stand on the eastern side of the harbour. This was originally intended as a station for the Russian fleet, but abandoned on account of its being exposed to the frequent rolling in of heavy seas to which it is subjected. On its western side lie the east and west Roge Islands. These are joined together by a shallow flat, which also stretches southward towards the main, and over which there are only six, nine and twelve feet water. Revel, or Reval, is the capital of the government, and is considered to have the best port in the province. In front of the harbour lies the island of Nargen, on the north end of which is a lighthouse with a revolving light. At the bottom of the bay stands the town of Revel, and a little to the eastward of the town is the Katarinendal lighthouse of great utility in entering. Footnote. A second lighthouse to the southward of the above has lately been erected, a description of which will be given hereafter. End footnote. The town of Revel is fortified by a mound and ditch. Its castle stands on a rock, the houses are of brick and well built, but the streets are narrow and irregular. There are thirteen churches, several schools, a foundry for cannon, a small palace and public gardens. But its cathedral was in 1820 consumed by lightning. Its inhabitants are computed at 13,000. The principal exports are corn, timber, hemp and spirituous liquors, and its imports are chiefly basalt, sugar, coffee and British manufactures. Two fairs are held annually. Kolkavik, Paponvik, Monkvik and Kaspervik are all open bays and places of good temporary anchorage. Kunda. This is a bay situated to the southward of Tonshar and about six leagues to the eastward of Kaspervik, well sheltered from the wind except to the northward. The depth of water is moderate and the anchorage good affording an excellent retreat for vessels in distress, and particularly adapted for merchant ships. The river Kunda, which takes its rise considerably inland, falls into this bay. The shores of this river are stocked with extensive forests of fir trees, and the timber is regularly and expeditiously floated down to the sawmills, which annually are capable of supplying 240,000 deals of the best quality. It is intended to furnish this bay with a mole or harbour, but the anchoring is so good and the Erdentras so easy that ships can load there at present with the greatest ease and safety. Narva is a place of considerable commerce, distant about eight miles from the sea. Its houses are built with bricks, but stuccoed white. In the suburb of Ivanogord are the remains of an ancient and extensive fortress, which overhangs the river in a very picturesque manner. There is also a lighthouse standing on the southern bank of the river. The depth of water is too little for vessels of any great draught to sail up it, so that large ships must light outside on the bar in six, eight or ten fathoms. The exports are timber, hemp, flax and corn, and the imports are salt, wine, tobacco, herrings, spices and grocery in general. St. Petersburg, the capital of Russia, is built on several islands, lying at the eastern extremity of the Gulf of Finland, at the mouth or entrance of the river Neva. 
it is of circular form, its diameter being about four miles in extent. The river Neva, flowing from east to west, divides it into two parts, the larger and more populous side being to the southward. That part on the north side is divided also by another branch of the Neva, which quits the main stream about the middle of the city and runs northwestward. This river is so very shallow at its entrance, having a bar, with only seven to ten feet over it, that loaded ships cannot approach St. Petersbury within the distance of three or four miles. Towards the land, St. Petersbury lies open, but the approach by sea is guarded by the fortress of Kronstadt, and in the middle of the city is a citadel. The situation of the capital is low and level, so that with westerly winds and high tides it is much inundated, an evil now endeavored to be remedied by depositing large quantities of earth whenever new buildings are intended to be erected, embanking the river and making stone keys. There are two bridges over the main stream of the Neva, and three over its lesser branches. These are formed by boats or barges moored at each end and covered with planks, which are regularly removed whenever the ice renders such removal necessary. Footnote. A handsome new bridge is now being erected near the Isaacs Bridge. The stone work is already said to be in a state of forwardness. May 1845. End footnote. The population of St. Petersburg is estimated at little short of 480,000 persons. Its commerce is extensive. Its exports consist of hemp, flax, tallow, leather, iron, skins, cordage, oil, soap, tax, honey, planks and rafters, fish, caviar, rhubarb, tobacco, isinglass, feathers and coarse linen, and its imports are English cotton manufactures, French wines, coffee, colors, drugs, indigo, dye woods, spices and pottery. All disputes and controversies respecting trade are arranged and settled by a board of trade, and all vessels are compelled to discharge their cargoes at and ship them off from the Kronstadt or St. Petersburg custom houses. Kronstadt is the seaport of St. Petersburg, and is now one of the principal towns and chief station of the Russian fleet. It is built upon the southeastern extremity of the island Retusari or Kotilin and is distant about three miles from the coast of Ingria and eight from that of Karelia. This island is about seven miles long and one mile broad. Kronstadt is guarded towards the sea by fortifications running into the water and towards the land by ramparts and bastions. It has three havens, one of which is devoted to merchant vessels and the two others to men of war. The merchant harbor is much the largest and calculated to contain 600 sail, but this, as well as the middle harbor, is exposed to the westerly winds. The war harbor has sufficient room for about 30 vessels, but there is not depth of water for such a number, some therefore repair to, or remain in, the middle port. It is said the brackishness of the water in the man of war harbor frequently produces the dry rot. Here is the entrance to the Grand Canal, which is 238 fathoms long, 56 feet broad, and 25 feet deep. It is entered from the sea and communicates with dry docks, which have a length of 150 fathoms more. The canal forms a cross, of which the middle is circular and entirely lined with granite. The water is let out of this dock by a sluice into a reservoir, whence it is pumped by steam engines into a canal adjoining and requires nine days to empty it. The dry docks are faced with stone and paved with granite. They are 40 feet deep and 150 feet broad. The man of war's mole is enclosed by a strong rampart of granite built in the sea. Here is a foundry for casting cannon, a rope walk for making cables of all sizes and great magazines filled with all kinds of naval stores. The principal port is defended by bastions of granite or wood, and the merchant's haven is closed by a boom 
and defended by a battery on each jetty head. The principal passage to St. Petersburg is between Kronstadt and the southern shore, but the deep water channel is very much narrowed by a sandy flat of shoal water, which spreads full three miles from the land. On the northern edge of this sand stands the castle of Kronslot or Kronschrott. This is a circular building mounting 50 guns, and on the Kronstadt side is the St. Peter's battery of 100 guns. These two are intended to defend the entrance of the passage, which is here contracted to about half a mile across, but its least depth is four fathoms. Sufficient water will therefore be found for the largest ships, and the channel can be opened or shut at pleasure. The channel to the north of Kronstadt is full of shoals, and blocked up by the hulks of vessels which have been purposely sunk there to prevent a passage. At Kronstadt the traveller must go to the harbour master's vessel and get his passport examined. He will then be allowed to enter the town, where an interpreter will attend him to the port admiral and military commandant, at whose offices his passport must be registered. He will then be suffered to choose his own habitation. In going to St. Petersburg, the customs only allow a sufficient quantity of apparel to be carried with him. The rest of his baggage must be sent up by the boat to the custom house at that city. There are two routes by which you may proceed, either by the steamboats which start from Kronstadt twice a day, or crossing to Orienbaum on the southern shore, and pass thence by land to St. Petersburg. You should endeavor to reach the city by daylight. The road lies through Orienbaum, Peterhof and Sterlna. The first of these is a town of considerable extent, pleasantly situated, and commands a beautiful view of Kronstadt, etc. Here stands a palace, 100 feet above the level of the sea. At Peterhof is another palace, the occasional residence of the imperial family. Here are a village and a stone church. Trelna also has a palace. It is 10 miles from St. Petersburg and is surrounded with woods and beautiful scenery, commanding also an extensive view of the gulf and city. Viburi is a town situated in Russian Finland, in the province of Karelia, about 98 miles northwest of St. Petersburg. It is built in a valley, well fortified, having a population of nearly 10,000 persons, who carry on a very considerable trade in timber, tar, pitch, tallow and fish. The navigation up the gulf to Viburi is intricate and requires a pilot. Virolax is a town further to the westward and has a small gulf or harbour chiefly frequented by fishermen. Frederikshavn or Haven. This is a large and well fortified town situated near an inlet about 50 miles to the westward of Viburi and containing a garrison of 6,000 men and exports similar articles to Viburi but more particularly planks and tallow. Lovisa is a strong seaport town and situated on the margin of a considerable inlet of the sea in Swedish Finland. It is protected by a fortress built on the island Svartholm. The inhabitants of this and the neighboring ports subsist chiefly by fishing, agriculture, grazing and making wooden ware. Their commerce is in grain, cattle, butter, linen and talc. Borgo stands to the westward of Lovisa at the entrance of a river of the same name. The navigation to this town is difficult and the trade inconsiderable. It is situated within the district of Newland. Helsingfors lies to the westward of Borgo and near the meridian of 25 degrees east. This is a populous and thriving town and considered the best port in Finland for large vessels. The entrance is defended by several forts. The principal is that of Sveabori, extending its fortifications through seven islands, having barracks, magazines and an arsenal all bomb-proof. Since the Russians have had possession of Helsingfors, the town has been very considerably improved and the commerce extended and enlarged. There are now two basins or docks for building and repairing ships and it exports corn, fish, logs, deals, 
salted provisions, etc. The coast to the westward of Helsingfors is studded with rocks and islands innumerable. The inland country wears a poor and barren appearance, and there is no town of any importance before you reach Ekenes. Ekenes, or Ekenes, is situated 15 or 16 leagues to the westward of Helsingfors, and to the eastward of Hanger Head. It is a small town with a population of 1300, standing southeast about 50 miles from Åbo, the capital of Swedish Finland. The navigation to this place is very intricate, yet the commerce is considerable. Åbo, formerly the capital of Swedish Finland, is situated in the latitude of 60 degrees 26 minutes 58 seconds north, 22 degrees 17 minutes 31 seconds east from Greenwich, at the extremity of the promontory formed by the gulfs of Finland and Botnia, and on the banks of the Aurajoki. It is a bishopric, and had a university, the greater part of which and nearly the whole of the city were destroyed by a fire in 1827. The city was well built, with a commodious harbour, and population of 13,000 persons. At the entrance of the river is a castle, and vessels of 9 or 10 feet water can go up to the town, but those of greater thought come to an anchor three miles to the southwestward of the river and convey their cargoes to Obu in boats. A considerable trade was formerly carried on, its exports being corn, iron, wood, cattle, fish, tar, pitch, salted provisions, furs, hides, coarse linen, deals, tiles, etc. End of section Section 2 of Piloting Directions for Gulf of Finland This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Piloting Directions for the Gulf of Finland by John William Nori. Section 2. A list of the lighthouses in the Gulf of Finland. At the given distances where the lights are first visible, the eye is supposed to be 15 feet elevated above the water. The latitudes and longitudes, as astronomically determined in the course of the late surveys, with the exception of those distinguished by an asterisk. Reader's note. In this table, latitude and longitude columns have been redacted. Note ends. Table of lighthouses. Dagerer fixed. Height 538 feet, visible 30 miles. Udensholm fixed. Height 110 feet, visible 16 and a half miles. Uttu north side fixed. Height 130 feet, visible from east southeast to west northwest 15 miles. Hange north side revolving. Height 100 feet, visible 15 miles. Packerert fixed. Height 146 feet, visible 18 miles. Surop head fixed. Height 136 feet, visible 17 miles. Nargin Island revolving. Height 95 feet, visible 12 miles. North Katarinendal Reval, height 125 feet, visible 17 miles. South Katarinendal Reval, fixed, height 210 feet, visible 20 miles. Ronskar North side, fixed, height 164 feet, visible 19 miles. Chirkskar fixed, height 99 feet, visible 15 miles. Glusholm north side revolving. Height 120 feet, visible from north northwest to west northwest 12 miles. Ekholm fixed, height 75 feet, visible 15 miles. Rutscher revolving. Height 60 feet, visible 12 miles. 
Nerva, fixed, height 72 feet, visible 15 miles. Hogland Upper Light, fixed, height 382 feet, visible 25 miles. Hogland Lower Light, fixed, height 28.5 feet, visible 10.5 miles. Summers, fixed, height 84 feet, visible 15 miles. Seashare, fixed, height 85 feet, visible 15 miles. Toll Beacon, fixed, height 88 feet, visible 16 miles. London Chest Light Vessel, 3 lights, height and visibility not given. Kronstadt Cathedral, height and visibility not given. St. Petersburg Observatory of the Academy of Sciences, height and visibility not given. The foregoing positions of lighthouses are selected from the table in the Journal of the Royal Geographical Society, volume 6, pages 414 and 415, as determined by Lieutenant General Schubert in 1833, during his chronometric expedition to determine the longitudes of the most important points on the coasts of the Baltic. Quote, by order of the Emperor, a steamboat and 56 chronometers were placed at the disposal of Lieutenant General Schubert, director of the depots of charts, etc., for the purpose of visiting during the summer of 1833 the most important points in the Baltic and of determining their longitude. That a great number of points might be visited during the short period of a northern summer, observers were sent beforehand to the various points to determine the time by means of transit or other instruments, which give the time with great precision. By this means, General Schubert had only occasion to stop at each point the time necessary to compare the chronometers with the astronomical clock there established, of which the rate was very exactly known by prior and subsequent observations, and was not obliged to wait for fine feather at each place. He was thus enabled, in one summer, to make the circuit three times of all these points. Quote continues. To give still greater extent to the undertaking, the Russian government entered into communication with the governments of Prussia, Denmark and Sweden, who on their part also sent observers to the most important points of their territories washed by the Baltic. It is thus that Stockholm, Altons and Lübeck have been comprised in the chain of points of which the longitude has been determined by this expedition. End quote. The shoals in the Gulf of Finland were formerly distinguished by white and red flags hoisted on high wooden crosses, the white flags denoting the north side and the red flags the south side of the respective shoals. But under an order of the Imperial Board of Admiralty in the summer of 1828, the red flags placed in the Gulf along the northern side of the channel between Hoogland and Kronstadt were superseded by wooden heads on the top of a pole, painted according to the color of the flag formerly used. And in 1829 this alteration was adopted more generally by the establishment of red and white beacons, instead of red and white flags that had previously distinguished the different shoals. Therefore, in future, ships are to sail to the northward of all the white and to the southward of all the red beacons. It has also been ordered that there should be placed on the sandbanks, reefs, etc. of the gulfs of Riga and Finland, near some of the beacons, common brooms, in order to furnish mariners with additional means of discovering the dangerous spots. The brooms placed on the northern side of the banks have their branches turned upward, and those on the southern side downward. End of section. Recording by Ventti Hirvonen, Finland. Section 3 of Piloting Directions for Gulf of Finland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Piloting Directions for the Gulf of Finland by John William Norrie Section 3. 
Directions for sailing up the Gulf of Finland. Vessels in entering the Gulf of Finland should always make proper allowance for the currents, for these generally are dependent upon the winds. Footnote. Captain Mitchell, late commander of the ship Anne of London, informs us that proceeding to St. Petersburg in 1825 and sailing between Hergland and Lavenshire during a heavy gale from the southward and eastward with a high sea, he experienced a current setting strong to windward and was unconsciously set on the island of Lavenshire, and the ship Flora, some few days previous, from the same course, had unexpectedly been set upon the island of Peni. End footnote. Are depended upon the winds, and thereby they are frequently driven with violence towards the Finland shores, from the meridian of the Gulf of Botnia so far as Vibri Bay, by which vessels are oftentimes carried greatly to the northward of their course, more especially with southerly and westerly winds. It is also not generally understood that many of the islands, which are so numerously scattered about the northern coast, are magnetic, and divert the polarity of the needle, thereby confusing the mariner in his proper course, and occasioning many serious and fatal losses. We are not able to state the exact extent of this magnetical influence, but it has been found to affect the compass in a particular manner in the vicinity of Yussari, where the attraction has been so great as frequently to make the needle turn quite round. In navigating these paths, the mariner will do well to guard against this phenomenon, and by keeping at a proper distance from the larboard or Finland shores, avoid their destructive effects. Vessels bound direct to St. Petersburg, will do well to bring the Dagerat light to bear south-south-east, distant about 15 miles. Their course will then be east by north, until Parkerer's light comes south by west, distant about 12 miles. Then steer east-north-east, about 6 leagues, until Nargen light bears south by west, distant about 10 miles. Pursue the direction of east half north for 7 miles, and then run direct east nearly three leagues, or until Churkskar light comes south by west. You will then be distant from the light about two and a half leagues, and may steer east half south twenty-three miles, or until you see Ekholm lighthouse bearing south by west. You will now find yourself four leagues to the northward of it, and may pursue your course due east six leagues. Then east northeast half east, five leagues, by which you will bring yourself in sight and abreast of the Hergland lights, bearing from you about east by north, distant two leagues. Having passed the Rotsker tower and light, leaving it about three or four miles to the southward, an east-northeast course for eight miles more will take you to the northward of Hergland, in from 26 to 32 fathoms water. Bring the light south, and steer due east nine miles. Then an east half south course will carry you to the southward of the Summers or Summer Island, upon which a lighthouse is erected. And when this lighthouse bears north by east from you, distant two miles, proceed east by south forty miles. This course will take you to the northward of the seashore light and the diamond stone, when an east southeast course twenty miles will carry you directly between the Toll Beacon and the London Stone in the fairway for Kronstadt. The track just described may be considered the fairway, and was pointed out and recommended by General Leotis Pafariov, chief director of the lighthouses in Russia. The great advantage of following this track as nearly as possible is, first, that by so doing you will steer clear of every danger, and, secondly, that by night you will have the advantage of the lighthouses to direct you throughout, for they are now so judiciously placed that you no sooner lose the direction of one light than you find yourself within the circle of another. All this light commence early in spring, as soon as the navigation is open, and then continue till the latter end of May. 
They recommence early in July and continue till the navigation ceases. But as the ports of Rivel and Baltic are frequently all the winter free from ice, all lights west of Rivel will continue to burn throughout the winter. All the lighthouses are lighted by reflectors, and in case of any unfortunate accident, the master of a ship may demand every assistance, and the officer at each lighthouse is bound to exert himself as much as possible for their safety. Should any neglect be observed by the mariner, either that the light should not be sufficiently bright, is lighted too late of an evening, or put out too early of a morning, it is requested that he will make his complaint thereof, taking care to be particularly exact in the month, day, and hour when such neglect occurred, in order that the journal of such lighthouse may be examined and the offender punished. But as there are numerous harbors and places of considerable trade on the different coasts we have passed, it will be necessary to return to Dagerort, in order to particularize them and the dangers to be met with more circumstantially. We have already described the lighthouse on Dagerort, the westernmost point of the island of Dago, and advised the mariner to keep at a distance from it when making for or in steering up the gulf on account of the shoals which lie off it. Hangar Light On the island of Janning, situated to southward of Hangar Head, a revolving light has been constructed on the old wooden beacon, elevated 100 feet above the level of the sea, which exhibits within the space of one minute one strong flash and two fainter lights. The latter are not totally eclipsed when seen within the distance of five or six miles, but the bright flash will, in clear weather, be visible at a distance of 15 miles. This light was first lit in July 1838. Neckman's Ground The first shoal we meet with is Neckman's Ground, about 5 miles in length and 4 in breadth, having from 4 fathoms to 9 feet upon it. On its northern end is a white beacon with a blue stripe, and a broom with its branches downward, in 6 fathoms, bearing north-northeast half-east from Dagerer's light, distant about 9 miles. The western point of Dagerer, southwest by west, 11 miles, and Cape Taki, east by south, 11 miles. Between it and the shore is a passage with 5, 6 and 7 fathoms, but too hazardous for a stranger to attempt. Off its northern edge are 7, 12 and further out 20, 30 and 50 fathoms, but about two leagues north-northeast from the beacon are some patches of broken ground called Vinkova, over which there are only four fathoms, though twenty, forty and seventy fathoms are round about it. On the northernmost shoal is placed a white beacon and broom with its branches upwards, and on the south side a broom with its branches downwards but no beacon. Apollon Ground the next danger is the Apollon Shoal, having 16 feet over its shoalest part. On its north end is a white beacon and a broom, with its branches upward in 5 fathoms. And on its south extremity is a red beacon and a broom, with its branches downward. And the middle of the shoal lies northeast by east 3 quarters east from Dagerot Light, distant 10 leagues. In clear weather, the Odensholm light will just become visible at this shoal. Seven miles to the southeastward of the Apollon is the stable button, a small knoll having a red flag upon it. Over the northern end of this are three fathoms, but near the red flag there are only three feet, while between it and the Apollon are nine, ten and fifteen fathoms. A beacon, striped red and white, is placed about one mile to the northwest of the red flag. Worms and Moon Passages There is a passage to the southward between Dago and Worms Islands, but little frequented by foreigners. Small vessels, having passed the stable button beacon and flag, may proceed southward towards Greser, where they will perceive a beacon. This must be left on the starboard side and nearly opposite is a flagstaff and flag placed on a small knoll. The channel is between the flagstaff and Greser beacon. 
this passage leads towards the Gulf of Livonia, to direct you to which there are several other flags and broom beacons, and when you are arrived near the end of Moon Island, you will see a beacon similar to that of Gresur, having passed which you will be in the Gulf of Livonia. There is also to the eastward of Worms another small channel between that island and Nuku or Nakka Island, within which is anchorage in two or three fathoms. This will lead to Habsal or Habsal, already mentioned as a place of little note. The roadstead called Worms Road or Deep Haven lies between the northeast end of Dagö and the northwest point of Worms. It runs to the westward of the Stapelbotten and has on its western side the Ankergrund. This is a cluster of rocks very dangerous at low water appearing just above the surface of the sea. The north point of Dagö bearing west by north the northwest end of Worms, southeast by east, half east, and Jacker Islet, south southeast, half east. There is also a kind of middle ground lying nearly midway between the western side of the north ground and the anchor ground called the Bias ground. This is about two miles from east to west and has for the least water between one and two feet. There is a passage on either side of it into Worms Road but the eastern one is much the safest and widest. Your course in will be south half east, and as you near Worms Ur, you will see a clump of trees on its southwest point. Keep those trees just open off the western side of the island, bearing south southeast, and you will, with large vessels, have good anchorage with twelve, ten, nine, and seven fathoms water. Or bring the north end of Worms Ur east, or east by south, its west end south south east, or south east by south, and then anchor in seven or eight fathoms soft clay, and distant two or three miles from the shore. If coming into Worms Road from the westward, after you have passed the Vinkova bank, bring Simperness west by south half south, or west southwest, and keep it so until the west end of Worms comes south south east. Then the clump of trees will be open, and you may sail in as before directed. There is plenty of room for twenty sail of the line, and numerous smaller vessels. The sea ebbs and flows a few feet according to the currents, which are feeble and irregular. There being no regular tide, ships therefore always ride with their heads to the wind. Wood, water and fresh provisions may be obtained from Worms Earth in plenty. If coming from the eastward, from the fairway or Nargen, you should bring in Odensholm lighthouse south or south by east, distant four or five miles, and steer west-southwest half south to clear the Apollon bank. Keep your lead going, and when you have run about four leagues on the above course, you will perceive the island of Worms about south by east, then bring its west end to bear south-southeast, and follow the directions given above. Observe if you get into 14 or 15 fathoms with Odensholm east north east or east by north, and the west end of Worms south south east, you may run boldly in by keeping the clump of trees open or nearly on. But if you shut them in, you will touch the west end of the north ground. With the trees touching the west ends of Worms, you will find 6 and 5 fathoms, but with it open of the trees, you will have seven, eight, and six fathoms. Udensholm. Directly east from the north end of the Apollon Shoal, distant sixteen miles, is the island of Udensholm, upon the northwest end of which stands a fixed light, one hundred and ten feet above the sea, and may be seen sixteen and a half miles off. Between Udensholm and Splinthead is a small and dangerous rocky shoal with only two feet over it, having a broom beacon on its northeast end with the branches upward. It is called the Sundstein, but uh, near it are twenty fathoms. It is not therefore advisable to pass to the southward of Udensholm. New Grounds To the eastward of Udensholm is a bank called the New or New Ground. At its northern extremity is a white beacon and broom with its branches upward in four fathoms water, 
bearing northeast by east half east five miles from Udensholm light. The shoalest part of the new ground has but four and seven feet over it. East by south half south, about ten miles from the beacon of the new ground, lies the grass ground bank. Upon this is a white flag or beacon. The bank is small, having two fathoms over some part of it, but there are two spots or patches upon it generally above water. Between the new and grass grounds are thirty to forty fathoms of water, and between the latter and the west roge, which is about two miles to the eastward, are twenty-six and twenty-seven fathoms. Port Baltic. The east and west roge are two islands, lying parallel to each other and encircled by a sandy bank, so that there is no passage for ships between them. But to the eastward is a spacious bay, called by some Rogervik Bay or Port Baltic. The eastern or larboard light of the entrance has a lighthouse upon it at Parkerer, lighted by a fixed light, 146 feet above the level of the sea. To the northward of this is a bank of sand, called Rogervik Count, having a white flag on its northwest side, and a red one on its southwest side. Its shoalest part has three fathoms water over it. Vessels sailing for this port should bring Parkerer Light to bear about southeast, distant three miles, and a south by east course will take them right in. This is an excellent place for shelter. The bottom, unless near the sides of the bay, is remarkably soft, and the soundings gradually decrease as you advance from thirty to three fathoms, the land all round being woody. At Port Baltic is a mole, about quarter of a mile above which is a sunken rock, on which is a floating beacon. East, three quarters north from Parkerer Point, is Surop Light, distant about eleven miles, and midway between these is another point called Lagusa, having a reef running from it. The lighthouse is round, with a fixed light on it, elevated 136 feet above the level of the sea. Rönnskär or Porkkala Light On the island of Rönnskär, which lies south by west half west, about one one half mile from Porkkala Head, is a light tower, which was altered in July 1838, to a fixed light at 164 feet above the level of the sea, and in clear weather is visible 19 miles off. This lighthouse bears north half east, 20 miles from Nargen Lighthouse. To the northeast of Surop Head is the island of Nargen, on the northern point of which is built a lighthouse, of the utmost importance to mariners navigating these seas. It is a round tower. 95 feet high, exhibiting a revolving light, three-fourths of the time being dark and one-fourth bright, and may be seen four leagues off. Revel or Reval Vessels bound to Reval will be particularly benefited by the above-mentioned light, as it will guide them clear to the Revel stone, and enable them to steer in the fair way for the Katharinendal light, which is built near the barracks at the top of Revel Bay, being placed in such a manner that it can only be seen when steering between the Wolf Island Reef and the 18 feet shoal or the New Stone, or Rangil's ground to the westward. A beacon is now placed upon the sand to the northward of Wolf Island, the appearance of which is engraved on the chart. Footnote. A second beacon has been lately placed nearly a mile to the northward of the above beacon, at the extremity of the shoal. These two beacons brought in a line show that the vessel is to the westward of the bank. End footnote. There is no passage between Wolf Island and the main. Vessels coming from the eastward with a fair wind will, by the Chokskar and Nargen lights, be enabled to run clear between the Revelstone and Devil's Eye, which, having passed, a southwest course will avoid the Wolf Reef taking care not to bring Chokskar light to the northward of east half north, for by so doing they will come too near that reef. Keep on this course until you see the northern Katharinendal light. 
this enlightens no more than the angle of the fairway. It will first be seen bearing south 2 degrees east, but when it becomes south 15 degrees east, the light will not be visible. When south 9 degrees east, the light becomes brightest, and you will be in the middle of the fairway. Continue this course unto the anchorage. By attending to these directions, a ship may not only sail into this bay with a fair wind, but best into the bay in bad weather and the darkest night, without the least danger. The following notice has been issued from the Russian Consulate General's office, dated February 9th, 1836. In order to facilitate the entrance of vessels to, or their departure from, the Revel roads during the night, between the shoals of the New Stone and Reval Stone, the Imperial Russian government has erected near the town of Reval, on the Luxbury Hill, a new wooden lighthouse, at the distance of 500 Sagines, 388.89 English yards, from the stone lighthouse standing near the Neval Barracks, and in the direction of south 9 degrees east. The new lighthouse has been lighted since the 20th of September last, and will henceforth continue to be lighted by means of seven reflectors, showing a fixed light visible from north 2.5 degrees west to north 29 degrees west at the distance of 20 Italian 17 English miles to an eye elevated 15 English feet above the water. The said lighthouse is situated in latitude 59 degrees 25 minutes 47 seconds north and in longitude 24 degrees 49 minutes 26 seconds east from the meridian of Greenwich. Its height, including the lantern, is 105 English feet above the foundation and 210 feet above the level of the sea. Mariners are further informed that the new wooden lighthouse is called the Southern Katarinendal Lighthouse and the old stone one the Northern Katarinendal Lighthouse, and that the latter has now seven reflectors instead of three as formerly. The light of the Northern Katarinendal will remain a fixed one as before at 125 English feet above the level of the sea, but from the 20th of September last it was and will henceforth continue to be visible from north 2 degrees west to north 30 degrees west at a distance of 17 and 3 quarters Italian miles to an eye elevated 15 English feet above the surface of the sea. End the notice. By the above notice it will appear that when the northern and southern Katarinendal lights are brought into a line, they will lead through the fairway of the channel. A ship coming from the eastward will, on approaching Wolf Island, see the Surup head light bearing southwest or southwest by west, but hauling up to the southward, they will lose sight of it. This is occasioned by some places on the island of Nargen being cut and cleared purposely of trees, so that the light may be seen through them. Mariners sailing with a southeast wind for this place should be aware of this appearance, for their seeing the Suru of light does not denote that the flags of the Nargen shoals are under their lee, but that they are abreast of them. The shoal to the eastward of Nargen Island, upon the middle part of which there are but four feet water, has two white flags upon its north extremities, one being on the east, the other on the west end of the shoal. Nargen Lighthouse bearing northwest by west three quarters west, distant two miles from the northernmost flag. Further on is the Lotte ground, having two red flags or beacons upon it, one being upon the eastern side, the other on its southern end. The first is in three and the second in a four one half fathoms. From the latter, Nargen Lighthouse bears northwest for one quarter miles, the northwest point of the Wolf Island, east half north to one half miles, and the Katarinendal Northern Lighthouse, south by east half east, eight and three quarter miles. There is also a small knoll or middle ground near the southeast end of Nargen, with a broom beacon upon its northern end. 
the southern extremity of the Nagin Shoal has a red flag upon it, and a white flag is placed upon the northern end of the middle ground. In coming from the westward and intending to go into Revel Bay, you may go to the southward of Nargen Island, in which case we recommend vessels to bring Odensholm Light to bear south by west, distant about six miles. A direct east course will then take you abreast of Suröp Light, which you should also bring south by west, distant nearly four miles. Steer southeast by south three miles further, or until the same light comes southwest by west, an east one quarter south direction will then clear the flag on the south end of the Nargen Reef, which having passed, steer east northeast until you come within the angle of the Katharinendal light, or within the two lights in one, or hoist your colors before you pass the south end of the island and a pilot will come off to you. There are two islands surrounded with a shoal lying off the western point of Revel called the Karls. To the northward of these is the middle ground. The flag on the northern end will point out the situation of this shoal, over which are two fathoms water. From the flag or beacon, the northwest point of Wolf Island bears northeast half north, distant four miles. Katarinenda Lighthouse, south southeast half east, and Surop Lighthouse, west by south. There are twelve feet on the shoalest part of this ground. Ragnil's ground, or the New Stone, having over it eighteen feet water, lies northeast of the Nargen Light, distant four miles and has two beacons upon it, a white one being at its northern end, and a broom with the branches upward, and a red one to the southward, and a broom with branches downward. These beacons are placed in five fathoms water. About one mile southeast by south from the red beacon is a white flag. The bearings from the white beacon are Nargen Lighthouse, southwest half south, distant four one half miles, the beacon on Revel South, east northeast, for one half miles, and Schirkskar Lighthouse, east three quarters south, twelve one half miles. The Revel Stone has a white beacon near its northwest end, and a red flag near its southeast part. This is a very dangerous bank with only four feet upon it. It lies east northeast, nearly from the Rangnils ground, distant for one half miles. From the Nargen Light, northeast half east, distant eight three quarter miles, and from the Jokskar Light, west northwest, distant nine miles. A beacon, striped black and white, is placed on some rocks that lie about half a mile to the southwestward of the shallow part of the Revel Stone. A rock has also been discovered three horses length from the shoal part of the same, bearing from it east southeast. The Devil's Eye is another dangerous shoal lying between Rangnil's ground and Schöckskör with a white beacon and a broom branches upward on its northern and a red one with a broom branches downward on its southern extremity. Over the shoalest part of this are seven feet only. It bears from Schöckskör light west three quarters north distant four miles. From the Revelstone south east by east distant five one half miles and from Nargen Light east by north, distant 12 miles. The new, or new ground, is a small knoll with three one half fathoms upon it. This has a white beacon and broom with branches upward to the northward, and a red beacon and broom with branches downward to the southward. The body of this shoal bears from the Devil's Eye south-southwest one quarter west, distant two one half miles. From the Nargen Light, east one quarter north, distant ten one half miles. From the white beacon on the Rangel Reef, west half north, distant two one quarter miles. And from Chuckskar Light, west southwest half west, distant about five miles. Between all the above shoals, the water is deep. There are also channels within and between the Rangel Islands with good anchorage but foreign vessels bound to St. Petersburg seldom frequent them. We shall therefore proceed towards Chukshkar. Chukshkar Lighthouse This lighthouse is built on a rocky islet, 
which is surrounded by a reef. It is 99 feet above the level of the sea and may be seen 16 miles off. At the extremity of its southeast reef is a red flag or beacon and near it are 8, 9 and 11 fathoms water. The passage between it and Wrangell Island has from 19 to 47 fathoms within it and to the northward there is also deep water. When the lighthouse on the north end of Nargen bears about south and distant two leagues, you may steer east-northeast two one half leagues, by which you will avoid the Rangnil's ground and the Revel Stone. Proceed on in that direction for five or five one half leagues, or until Chökskar light bears south. You should then shape a course due east, which will lead cheer of the Kalvoden or cable grounds having passed which steer about east by north, and you will arrive at the northern end of the island of Hergland. The Kalboidan or Cable Grounds From Chökskar light northeast by east one quarter east, distant nearly nine leagues, lies the Cable Ground, a dangerous shoal, about three leagues from the islands on the Finland shore, consisting of several sharp-pointed rocks, parts of which sometimes appear above water. They are seven miles in circumference and are pointed out by three flags, viz. a red flag to the southward. Distant one one half mile from this red flag is a white one, placed on the edge of a shoal with only twenty three feet water. This latter flag is but a little way, about one one half mile from the Nanis or Nalis rocks, where also is another flag. These are very dangerous shoals and not within the view of any lighthouse. It is therefore advisable in navigating this part not to lose sight of the lights to the southward, and particularly to get and keep the light of Ekholm in view. By so doing, you will have nothing to fear from any of them. Glusholm Light On the island of Glusholm, opposite the south point of the island of Bellingen, a lighthouse was erected in 1836. It is lighted with a revolving light, completing its revolutions every three minutes, during which period it is visible three times for the space of twenty seconds each time between north-northwest and west-northwest, with an interval of darkness for forty seconds between each illumination. The lantern is one hundred and twenty feet above the surface of the sea, and the light is visible twelve English miles to an eye elevated fifteen feet above the water. This lighthouse bears north by east, distant thirty miles from Ekholm Lighthouse. The Ekholm is a lighthouse with a fixed light seventy-five feet above the sea, and may be seen fourteen miles off. It must prove of great utility as it not only enables ships to avoid with certainty the above dangers of the cable ground in their passage to Hergland, or the chalk grounds in their passage to Narva, but also enables mariners to sail into Kolkavik, Papenvik, Monkvik and Kaspervik, more especially Monkvik, where vessels frequently run for shelter and where the anchorage is good. The Ekholm lighthouse is built upon the small island of Ekholm, bearing from Chökskar light east by south nearly, and distant eight leagues, from the southern flank of the cable ground south half east distant six leagues, from Hogland north end west southwest one quarter south nearly, distant forty four miles, from Ruthshire lighthouse west southwest thirty three miles, and from the light of Narva west northwest distant seventy two miles. End of section. Recording by Bent Hirvonen, Finland. Section 4 of Piloting Directions for Gulf of Finland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Piloting Directions for the Gulf of Finland by John William Norrie. Section 4. The Passage to the Southward of Hoogland and to Narva, etc. Chalk Ground. G. 
due east from Eckholm Light is the chalk ground, distant ten miles. Eckholm Light will prove of great service in directing you to avoid this shoal, which is very dangerous, having no more than five feet over it in one part. By bringing the light west by south, you will go to the northward of it, and by bringing it west by north, you will be carried to the southward. There is a white flag on the northern, and a red beacon with broom branches downward on its southern extremity. The southern passage has several patches of broken ground, but none of known danger. The northern channel has deep water until you reach the Stoniskar. The Stoniskar and Rothskar The Stoniskar is a small rocky island, about three-quarters of a mile long. It lies northeast by east from the chalk ground, distant ten and a quarter miles. It is of bold appearance and steep to the northward, but from its south end a reef runs off two miles over which the water is very shallow. A beacon and a pole is now exhibited upon this island, where also there are a few fishermen's huts. In nearly a northeast by east direction lies the Rothskar Island, distant from the Stoneskar fourteen miles, and from Hochland Light eleven miles. Rothskar Island is now distinguished by a lighthouse, the official notice for which was as follows. Quote, it having been found that ships bound from Narva to Reval, for the most part direct their course between the islands Rothskar and Stoneskar, so that the lighthouse erected in 1815 on Cape Lativanum is of little service, considering also the impediments to navigation from the dangerous shoals situated at the extremity of Hochland, and that the upper lighthouse on that island is, in autumn, frequently concealed by fogs, which render the light invisible, his Imperial Majesty's government has resolved to remove the lighthouse from Cape Latifanim to the island of Rotskar, situated at nine miles to the westward of Hoogland. The light on this lighthouse is sixty feet above the surface of the water, and in imitation of that of Latifanim, will open and shut successively at intervals of three quarters of a minute, by which it will be sufficiently distinguished from all others in the vicinity of Hoogland. End quote. When to the northward of Rotskar, and abreast of it, you will first perceive the light on Hoogland, being then about nine miles off. But should you get to the southward of Rotskar, this light will not be visible, continuing darkened until you get to the eastward of south-southeast quarter east. You will then be on the east side of Hoogland, Within this space, and to the southward of Hoogland, are several islands and dangers which we shall now proceed to describe. Rothskar, already mentioned, is surrounded with a reef extending to the east and southward about a mile. Close to the west side are said to be only four fathoms, but at a little distance are twenty-nine and thirty-four fathoms. East-southeast half-south from Rothskar is the North Virgen, or Viringen Island, this is joined to the South Virgen by a reef, which also extends north and south of the islands. West of the South Virgen, above two miles, is a shoal, with only six feet over its shallowest part. To the southeastward of these islands are two smaller ones, with a reef encompassing them, on the north end of which a buoy is placed. They are called the Kala Islands, and are four and a half miles from the Virgens. Further on, in nearly the same direction, is the great Titer Island, about two miles long, and nearly as broad. From its southern side a reef extends a considerable way. Great Titer is four and a half miles from Vikala, east half north nine miles from Little Titer, and south by east three quarters east ten miles from the south end of Hoogland. The Little Titer is distant from Stoneskar fifteen miles, and bears nearly east by south from it. The Hofts. Ten miles to the southward of Stoneskar are the Hofts, a dangerous shoal, formed by six or seven rocks above water, joined by a reef, extending from the northern rock two and a half miles towards the main. There are, however, fifteen fathoms between it and the shore, and from twenty-five to thirty between it and Stoneskar. A pyramidical beacon, with a ball at the top, is now erected upon the north Hofts, and is shown on the chart. Kunda Bay. This is a bay lying to the southward of the Hofts, and now frequented by vessels for timber, etc. Its entrance is easy, and its anchorage good, for on some heights inland 
two beacons are so erected that when a vessel arrives off the harbour and brings these in one, a south-easterly course will carry them right into the bay without danger, or any necessity for the assistance of a pilot. You may anchor in from six to three fathoms, but further in, near the mouth of the river, it becomes shallow. The shores are lined with pines and fir trees. For further particulars, see page two. East by south from the southern part of the Hofts is a small knoll, called the Baraban, with three fathoms. There are six and seven near it, and further out all deep water. There is also a shoal lying south-southeast from the Great Titer, distant eight miles, having two flags upon it to point out its situation, with only five feet upon it. It is called the Nye Ground. East half-south from hence, distant eight and a half miles, is the Namsi Shoal, with ten feet water. Upon its northwest end is a broom beacon, with branches upward. To the eastward of this are the Vitskars, being four rocks above water, enclosed by a reef stretching southwestward. Between the Namsi and Vitskars are ten fathoms, and between the Namsi and the Nye Ground twenty to thirty fathoms. There is also a passage to the eastward of the Vitskars, between it and the main, with from four to five fathoms, but there are three knolls within it, having only three to three and a half fathoms. It is therefore used only by small vessels, which that draught of water will not affect. The Bay of Narva lies to the southward of these dangers, and is now distinguished by a lighthouse built on the south side of the Narva River. This is a round tower, seventy-two feet high, bearing a fixed light, which may be seen between four and five leagues off. The entrance to this river is shallow, and vessels loading here with timber are obliged to lie off the shore. Formerly boats employed in conveying the goods from the ships to the shore, and vice versa, have been lost, but the light, it is trusted, will now be a sufficient guide for them, and effectually prevent any such accidents in future. The channel of the river is pointed out by a flag placed on the extremity of the southernmost sand, the distance from which to the town is about seven and a half miles. Vessels bound for Kronstadt seldom take the southern passage, but go to the northward of Hoogland. Should they, however, be bound to Kaspervik, Kunda, or Narva, the following directions may prove acceptable. Having advanced up the Gulf of Finland so far as to be abreast of Kokskar, bring the lighthouse about south, distant four or six miles. Steer east by south, a little southerly, until you get abreast of Eckholm. This island lies east by south, distant twenty-three and a half miles from Kokskar. On your starboard hand, in this passage, you will have the harbours of Kolkowick, Papenwick, Monkwick, and Kasperwick, all affording safe anchorage in cases of emergency. Kasperwick is a good harbour, and may readily be known by the east point of entrance, being a bold bluff land, covered with trees, but you should always give the points of land a good berth, for great stones lie off them, and a shoal stretches from the east point, and the whole of the east side of the bay is bordered with another, one and a half cable in breadth. Being abreast of Eckholm, keep close to the island, and steer south-east by east, until you open the bay of Kasperwick, then run in south by east. Keep mid-channel, giving the points a good berth, and you will find your water lessen from sixteen to ten fathoms, until you get abreast of a little village and church, where you have from eleven to seven fathoms. Clear and good holding ground, the nearer to the western side the better, for in mid-channel your cables will be apt to chafe. Should you choose to go further in, you will ride safe in five fathoms, but with north-north-easterly winds a short sea tumbles in, occasioning vessels to pitch much. They will lie unrestrained on their cables, owing to the current, which sets outward, and they open the wind two points on each bow. If bound to Narva, get the Eckholm light to bear south, distant three or four miles, and proceed east by south. This will carry to the northward of the chalk ground, and also that of the Hofts. When, being abreast of the latter, and bringing the beacon of the Hofts to bear south, an east-south-east half-south course will carry you direct to the Narva road. We have already observed that vessels bound for Kronstadt seldom take the southern channel, but go to the northward of Hoogland, for which purpose, having passed the Kalbaden or cable grounds, described in page 11, they will proceed with an east-by-north course until they are within sight of the Hoogland lights. Bring the low light on that bearing, distant two miles, and you will have passed a rocky bank called the Lepjanekkawave ground to the larboard, 
having only twenty-seven feet over it. Upon the south end of this bank is a red beacon, and broom, with branches downward, and to the northward are two flags, denoting other shoals and dangers. On one of these there are only nine feet water. Be careful, therefore, not to bring the low light to the southward of the above bearing, lest you get entangled among them, many of the rocks on the northern shore being extremely dangerous. Having brought the low light east by north, distant two miles, we will observe a beacon standing upon the northernmost point of Hoogland. This is furnished with a bell, and is to commence ringing whenever the weather becomes dark or hazy, and to continue ringing until it clears up. This bell, to distinguish it from all others, will be struck four times in a minute, then a pause of five minutes will take place, when the ringing will recommence until the light becomes visible. Having discovered this beacon, you will proceed to the northward of it, taking care not to go above one and a half mile from it, in passing, on account of a knoll of twenty-three feet water, upon which is placed a red beacon, and broom with its branches downward. Both ends of Hoogland are steep too, and there are twenty fathoms very near the island. There is, however, a small spot between the knoll to the northward of the red beacon and the island where you will get only seven fathoms. This will be seen by inspecting the chart. When you have brought the lights in one, then an east half-south course will take you within sight of the summer's light. This is the customary passage. But some ships, as before observed, go to the southward of Hoogland, especially since the establishment of the lighthouse on Rothskar. We have already said that Hoogland is bold, steep at both ends, and the largest vessels may pass within a quarter of a mile from shore. The southern channel lies between Rothskar, Wiringen, and Wikela, on the starboard, and Hoogland on the larboard. It is nearly two leagues wide, and has from twenty-six to thirty-eight fathoms within it. If desirous of anchoring on the east side of Hoogland, bring the north point of the island to bear northwest half-west, the southern point south, and the sandy beach which is south of the town about west, and you will have twenty fathoms of water, being half a mile from the shore. Further off, the water deepens to twenty-nine and thirty-four fathoms. End of section four. Section five of Piloting Directions for Gulf of Finland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Piloting Directions for the Gulf of Finland by John William Norrie. Section 5. From Hoogland to Aspo and Fredrikshan. To the northward of Hoogland are extensive shoals, stretching towards and beyond Aspo. The outermost of these extends full three miles north-northeast, and is above one and one-half mile broad, and on the southern part of this shoal there are only seven feet of water. This is named the Tanier Shoal, or Bank of Stones. In the middle are two feet at a place called Kalu, and at the northeast end, near which are four rocks above water, are three feet. There is a red flag commonly fixed at the southern part of this shoal, its northeast end, or Itkalu, bears from the lights of Hogland, north, one quarter east, distant six miles. Aspo is a small island, on which stands a white tower or beacon. To the southward of this is also another beacon, on the rock islet of Leskar, and these serve to guide vessels to Fredericksham. They are two of a cluster of small islands, which lie scattered about and directly on the way to the town. Adjoining the westernmost of these islands is an extensive shoal, called Aspo Gadar, great part of which appears above water. If bound to Fredericksham, your course from the north end of Hoogland will be northeast by east, ten or eleven miles. You will then be in the vicinity of Aspo Island. This is a good anchorage for merchant vessels, but not for ships of war. It will readily be known by the beacon on Leskar Island Rock which is to the starboard, and another beacon at Aspo Island. In entering this channel, do not near the shores too much, but bring Leskar Beacon to bear about northeast, or northeast by north. You will then avoid the foul ground which is to the seaward. Steer direct for the beacon, 
giving it a berth of about a ship's length on your starboard side. With westerly winds, be careful not to go too near any of the rocks, which appear above water, than a full ship's length. Indeed, it is best to go in mid-channel between the rocks and beacon. There is all the way from Lescar to Aspo, good anchorage and clear ground, holding well, from twelve to sixteen fathoms. Pilots may be had here to take you to Frederiksham. From Hoogland to Weiber Your course from the north end of Hoogland to Weiber will be east by north seven or eight leagues. This will carry you to the northward of Somers Island, where a lighthouse is erected, with a fixed light, elevated eighty-four feet above the sea, and may be seen eighteen miles off. Passing Itakabi rocks and shoals, and steering on in the same direction, you will see on your starboard side the little island of Nervo, having a beacon tower upon it, and to your larboard the Vizcaran, or great Fiskaran islands. To the southwestward of these is the Satama rock, with only nine feet of water over it. It is three-quarters of a mile from the western Fiskaran. One mile southeast from the Satama is the Congolund rock, with only two feet water. To avoid the Satama, do not bring the western Fiskaran to the northward of northeast until you are within half a mile of its southern point. You may then steer along east and east by north. Pass the Fiskarans within three-quarters of a mile distance, having twelve and fifteen fathoms of water. And when the eastern Fiskaran comes northwest, you may steer northeast half-east, for the little Fiskaran, in eighteen, twenty, twenty-two, sixteen, and fifteen fathoms. There are passages to the northward of the Fiskaran, up the Werolax, but they must not be attempted without proper pilots. To the eastward of the little Fiskaran island, or rock, are two shoals, with two flag beacons on their north ends. The beacon flag on the westernmost shoal stands about one and one-quarter mile east, three-quarter south, from the south end of the little Fiskaran. On this shoal there are only five feet of water. In passing through, between the island and the beacons, you will have eight, thirteen, ten, and eighteen fathoms water. When the easternmost beacon bears south by east, distant about half a mile, you will see two other beacons, the nearest of which will bear about east-northeast one-half north, distant, and about two and one-half miles. Steer for this beacon in thirteen, ten, nine, fourteen, fifteen, and eleven fathoms. You will have the latter depth abreast of the beacon, which stands in six fathoms of water. In proceeding for this beacon, you will pass between the tail of a reef, which runs off from Crozer Ort, and a shoal, which lies about one mile east-southeast, one-half south, from it. The former bears west, distant one and three-quarters mile from the beacon, and the ground near to it is so flat that a quarter of a mile without, or to the southward of it, you will have only four fathoms water. The northernmost end of the latter lies one mile west-southwest from the beacon, with three and a half fathoms water on it, and so steep that close to it are fourteen fathoms. About a mile northeast half east from the beacon is another, in four fathoms of water. They both stand on the reef, which runs off nearly a mile from Corsor Ort, and therefore must be left to your larboard side. As there are five, four, seven, and eight fathoms within the line of the beacons, you may steer from the one beacon to the other, in eleven, seven, six, and eleven fathoms water. You will have the latter depth close to the easternmost beacon. The channel between these beacons and the salvor ground is not above three-quarters of a mile wide. The Salvor ground extends two and one-half miles northwest and southeast, and that end which is next to the beacons is about two miles broad. The northwest point of it bears east-southeast, about a mile from the westernmost beacon, and has only six feet of water on it. The northeast point of this shoal lies about east, one and one-half miles from the easternmost beacon, and has five miles water on it. On the shoalest part of this ground there are only two feet water. From the easternmost beacon you steer northeast by east, about seven miles, to the northernmost of these islands, which lie off Caper Ort, 
In proceeding upon this course, you will have eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and fourteen fathoms water. The first island is small, and lies about one and one-half mile north-northwest from the point. About a mile east-southeast from the second small island, there stands a beacon on the northeast point of the shoal, on which there are only ten feet of water. Off the third small island you may anchor in eight fathoms water, and also off the beacon in thirteen fathoms. From this beacon, the south point of Tekasari Island lies north by east, one-half east, distant one mile. In passing through between the islands and shoal of Keeper Ort and the south point of Tekasari Island, you will have thirteen, twelve, ten, fifteen, and twelve fathoms water. Middle Channel to Wyberg This is another channel through which ships may pass to Wyberg. First you may steer east three-quarters north from the north end of Hoogland for the northwest point of Tosari Island until you are within three miles of it, the distance being about fifteen leagues. In steering this course, you will pass to the northward of the small islands Somers and Nervo, upon the former of which there is a lighthouse, already described, and upon the latter a tower or beacon, sixty-five feet high. You will not have less than ten or thirteen fathoms all the way. When the northwest point of Tosori Island bears east-northeast one-half east from you, distant two miles, you will be a mile northwest from the north end of a rocky shoal, which lies one and one-half mile southwest from the northwest point of Tosari Island, and about three-quarters of a mile south-southwest from a small spot on which are three fathoms water. This knoll lies about two and one-half miles southwest by west, one-quarter west, from the aforesaid point. From your before-mentioned situation, you will see a small island, called Rond, bearing about north one-half east, distant five miles, steer north one-half east for it. In your way you will have sixteen, thirteen, seventeen, twenty, nineteen, fifteen, and thirteen fathoms water. In this track is one small spot, on which are only six fathoms. You will pass about three-quarters of a mile to the westward of a small spot on which are three fathoms water, and about one and one-half mile to the eastward of another, which has only four feet on the shoalest part. The former lies about west, one and one-quarter mile from the northwest point of Tosari Island, and the latter lies three and one-half miles west-northwest from the said point. You will also pass about half a mile to the eastward of a small spot on which are three fathoms, and above half a mile to the westward of the north end of a rocky shoal, on which are also three fathoms water. The former lies about one and one-quarter mile south-southwest three-quarter west from the southeast point of the island Rond, then steered for, and the latter lies one mile southeast by south from the said island. This shoal extends one and one-half mile north by west three-quarter west and south by east three-quarter east, and is about a quarter of a mile broad. On this shoal are from six to three fathoms water. The shoalest part is on the north end. Off the south end are six fathoms. Close to it, along the west side, are eight, seventeen, eighteen, and fifteen fathoms, and off the north end are six fathoms. In the fairway, between the north end of this shoal and the island of Rond, you will have eight and ten fathoms. When you are about half a mile east from Rond Island, steer north-northeast toward Keeper Ort. The distance is about six miles. In this tract, you will have eleven, sixteen, fifteen, sixteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, twelve, and fourteen fathoms water. You will pass about a mile to the westward of a small island called Poyankivi, and about three-quarters of a mile to the eastward of Skesk Ground, on the shoalest part of which there is only one foot of water. The former lies two and one-half miles south by east from Keeper Ort. The easternmost part of the latter lies two miles west-northwest from the former, and from Keeper Ort it lies two miles southwest three-quarters south. Near to the west side of Poyankivi Island are five fathoms, Near to the easternmost part of skeist ground are eight fathoms, and in the mid-channel between them are twelve and fifteen fathoms. When you are within a mile of Keeper Ort, steer north by west about two miles, or until you are abreast of the northernmost of the small islands which lie to the northward of Keeper Ort. You will have thirteen, ten, twelve, eight, twelve, and fourteen fathoms water, and pass nearly half a mile to the westward of a rocky shoal, 
which lies about a mile north-northwest one-half west from Keeper Ort, and about a quarter of a mile south one-quarter west from the aforesaid small island. When you are about half a mile west from this island, you will then be in the former track, and may proceed as before directed. Bayorko Sound If entering Wyberg through Bayorko Sound from the southward, you will observe the Grikova Rock, lying to the southwestward of the entrance, with only three fathoms over it, and having a red beacon and broom with branches downward near it to point out its situation. It is about four miles from the south end of Bayoko Island. On the west side of the channel there is also a shoal, on which are only fourteen feet water. It is small, has a white flag on it, and lies half a mile southeast from the southeast point of Bayorko Island. On the southern point of Bayorko Island stands a remarkable round tower, forty feet high, and serving to point out the entrance of the inner channel. On opening Bayorko Sound, you will perceive a little island, which, if kept open of Bayorko Island, will run you into fair berth mid-channel. You may steer in northwest by north, till you come to a church and village on the starboard shore, where you may anchor in seven fathoms, sticky ground, and obtain a pilot. When the wind blows strong from the westward, and you find you cannot keep to windward, run for Bjorko Sound, where you may ride safely and secure from any wind. And should the gale be far from the southward, you will have plenty of room to work out with safety. Very few boards will carry you clear of the white flag at the west point. About one and one-half mile northeast from the white flag is the island Circoloto. From midway between them, steer five miles northwest for where to name point. In your way you will have nine, twelve, sixteen, seventeen, fourteen, fifteen, seventeen, and thirteen fathoms. When you are off the northeast part of the island Ripina, steer in the mid-channel, between it and the main, towards the small island of Mandarlo. In this point of the channel you will have twelve, nine, and ten fathoms. Off where Tonimi Point stands a beacon, and about one and one-half miles north-northwest half-west from it is another in five fathoms water. After having passed in mid-channel between the first beacon and the small island, steer towards the second beacon, keeping it on your starboard bow. Between the beacons you will have fourteen, ten, and seven fathoms, and off the second beacon you will have twelve or fifteen fathoms. From this beacon, steer north one-half west, about two miles, and pass between the island of Pispolata and the main, giving the main about two-thirds of the channel. You will have, from abreast of the beacon, twelve, seven, twelve, fourteen, fifteen, fourteen, twelve, and fourteen fathoms. When Manola Point bears east-southeast, distant about half a mile, you must steer northwest by north five miles. On this course you will have 15, 14, 15, 17, 12, 14, 16, 17, 16, and 17 fathoms water. You will pass along the east side of the island Bicapso at the distance of half a mile, and about three quarters of a mile from a rocky shoal, which runs off from the main three quarters of a mile. Close to the island are ten and seven fathoms, and close to the shoal eight fathoms water. When the north point of Picapso bears south by west, distant once mile, the north end of a rocky shoal, called Gerardlotte, will bear northeast by east, three-quarter east, distant nearly one mile. This end of the shoal lies almost a mile from the nearest part of the shore. You may then steer about north by west between the little island of Poyankivi and scarce ground, for the northwesternmost of the islands which lie to the northward of Keeper Ort. Your distance to abreast of the latter will be about five and a half miles, and your depths of water will be seventeen, fifteen, fourteen, thirteen, fourteen, thirteen, eleven, ten, eight, twelve, and fourteen fathoms. In this track you will pass about three quarters of a mile to the westward of Poyankivi Island, and about the same distance to the eastward of the Skest ground, and when you are about half a mile from the westernmost of the aforesaid islands, you will then be in the first, or northwesternmost track, and may proceed as before directed. There is a passage between Keeper Ort and the island that lies to the northward of it, but it is very narrow, and therefore not to be attempted without a pilot. From Hoogland to Kronstadt and St. Petersburg We have already said that when Hoogland lights are one, distant one and a half mile, your course will be nearly east, for nineteen or twenty miles, 
until you are abreast to the southward of the light on Summer Island, distant two or three miles. An east by south course will take you to the northward of the stone ground of Lavenskar, and between them to the Nervo Tower. This part was formerly considered very dangerous, particularly to large ships that were obliged to beat about with foul winds and bad weather. But the Somers Island Light, which is about halfway between the Seskar and Hoagland Lights, will distinctly lead clear of every danger. Thus, in clear weather, before the Hoagland Lights are lost sight of, the Somer Light will become visible, and while still the Somer Light continues in sight, you will perceive the Seskar Light. The island of Somers is steep too, except to the eastward, where there is a reef stretching out considerable way towards the northeastern part of the island. There is a harbor running in between two points, and penetrating toward the body of the island. Here vessels, in case of necessity, may run in, and find good anchorage in five and four fathoms water, shallowing as you advance within it. The island of Nervo, upon which the beacon tower, painted red, is erected, and on each side of it a small turret, is bold and clear all around. The stone grounds of Lavenskar have on their northern points two beacons, both white, the western one being in twenty feet of water, the eastern one in nineteen feet. Near these beacons are brooms with branches upward. The shoal then stretches away to the southward about two miles, its southeast point having seventeen feet over it, and being not far distant from the north end of the reef, which stretches from the point of the island of Penny, on this are five fathoms. From the western beacon, Somers Lighthouse bears northwest one quarter west, distant eight miles, the Tower of Nervo, northeast by north, seven miles, and the northwest end of the island Levensari, south southwest one quarter west, distant six and one half miles. The northwest end of Levensari, or Levenskar Island, lies east southeast, distant twenty six miles, from the northern part of Hoogland. It is an irregularly shaped island four miles long and three and a half broad. At its northeastern part is a small harbor, narrow but safe, where vessels may find good anchorage and tolerable shelter. A conspicuous four-sided pyramid beacon, eighty feet in height, with an iron vane on its apex, is erected on the northernmost part of Lavenskar. The northeast and northwest sides are painted white, and the southeast and southwest sides red. The roof is black. Another beacon, in the shape of a shield, twenty-five feet long and eight broad, is placed one and one-half Italian miles southeast from the beacon, on the north end of Lavenskar. The beacon is twenty-eight feet in height and thirty-five feet above the sea. The north side is painted black, with a white spot in the middle. Penny Island lies to the eastward of Lavenskar Island and, like that, is surrounded with reefs. There are also some smaller banks, one of them having only seven feet water over it lying between the northern points of Penny and Lavenskar. To the southward of these banks is anchorage in fifteen fathoms water, but the passage to the southward of these and the Seskar Islands is very narrow, difficult, and dangerous, for the reefs which run out from Lavenskar's southern points and the long spit which stretches from Kurgala Point approach so near each other, and other reefs lie so scattered about, one being directly midway and others to the westward and southward, that the utmost caution, as well as a knowledge of the navigation, is necessary to sail through this channel. The Seskar is a low island, having many trees upon it. Formerly a lighthouse stood on its northeast point, but it has been taken down, and another built on the northwest point. This lighthouse, bearing a fixed light, is much higher than the former one was, being eighty-five feet above the sea, and visible at the distance of fifteen miles. The Seskar is surrounded by reefs, one stretching out northwest by north about three miles from the light, on the point of which are no more than two fathoms. Here a white beacon is placed, and broom with branches downward. To the southward of this beacon are two rocks or islets, called Kokare, the above reef enclosing them, and running out southeast at least two miles from the south end of the island, having on its extremity about five fathoms. There is anchorage on the east side of Seskar Island in from eight to ten fathoms, the former being proper for small vessels, the latter for men of war. To anchor, it will be advisable to bring the lighthouse west by north, or west-northwest, and the south part of the island southwest one half south, and if steering in from the northward, to come no nearer the reef than seven fathoms water, until you can get the lighthouse southwest by west. Then approach the island no nearer than four or three fathoms, 
with the light west northwest or west northwest one half west, and the south part of Sescar southwest by south, you will be one mile from shore in eight or nine fathoms, and with nearly the same bearings you may ride farther off in sixteen or seventeen fathoms. But if necessary to anchor to the southward of Sescar Island, you must go no nearer to the reef on the east side than five fathoms, no farther off than eight or nine fathoms, for should you do so, you will quickly get into shallow water of two and a quarter fathoms, and see the rocks above water to the southward. But by observing these directions you will have good ground, and may ride safe having five, six, or seven fathoms water. South of the Sescar is the middle ground, a dangerous shoal with only twelve feet water. To the westward of that is the west ground, a long and narrow reef, stretching southerly as far as the Ingria shore, and about four miles southeast one-half south, from the southeast point of Lavansari, is a small rock above water, called Kaloda. And four miles southwest by west, from the Kaloda rock, is the rust ground, with only three feet of water over it. Southwest from this is the Rutansari, with five feet over it. These tend to make the passage to the south of the Seskar dangerous. Having, therefore, as before directed, passed the stone grounds and Nervo Island, and obtained sight of the Seskar light, then sail on east by south one-half south, which will carry you clear of every danger, passing the light at about the distance of six miles, in twenty-six, twenty, fourteen, eighteen, and twenty fathoms, and leaving at a considerable distance, on the larboard side, the Grakova rock, on which is a red beacon, as mentioned before, near the entrance to Bjorko Sound and the diamond ground on your starboard. The diamond ground, or stones, are three shallow patches, small and placed in triangular form, they are distinguished by three flags and a beacon. Near the southwestern patch are seventeen feet, and a blue flag and broom, with its branches downward. On the northeastern patch are twenty feet and a white beacon and broom, with branches upward, bearing east-southeast from Sescar Light, distance twelve and one-half miles. And on the southern patch only four feet, and a red and white flag. This is properly the diamond stone, and is very dangerous. It bears east-southeast one-quarter south, from the Sescar Light, from Dagoinus Tower, northwest by west, seven and one-half miles, and from Styers Uden Tower, southwest, distant sixteen miles. Having therefore proceeded in the foregoing east by south, one-half south direction, until you lose sight of the Seskar Light, you may be assured you have passed the Diamond Stone. Then alter your course to east by south, and you will go midway between the coasts of Carhelia and Ingria. There is now a tower erected on Dolgoinus, fifty feet high, and another, with a staff and ball, on Styers Uden, thirty-five feet. This latter is intended to be made into a lighthouse. For a Seskar light is lost sight of some time before that of the toll beacon is visible, and as in that space the current frequently runs with great force toward Wyberg Bay, vessels are often carried out of their course, and led into danger, which a light on Styers Uden would effectually prevent. On the south side of the gulf a pyramid wooden beam is erected, on the hill, called Stripilov, with two shields on the top, in the form of a cross. The pyramid is painted white, and the cross black. It is forty-five feet in height, and a hundred and seventy-one feet above the level of the sea, in latitude fifty-nine degrees, fifty-eight minutes, thirty seconds north, longitude twenty-nine degrees, nine minutes east. The channel now between these two points narrows considerably. You will, however, have a clear passage, and good deep water of seventeen, sixteen, and fifteen fathoms. The shores on each side are bold and without danger. You will now soon perceive the toll beacon's fixed light before you, which, like Seskar, is eighty-eight feet high, and may be seen at the distance of fifteen miles. We have already said that when neither of these lights are visible, your situation must be to the eastward of the diamond stones. Therefore, having made the toll beacon light, your course will be east-south-east, which will convey you clear between the toll beacon and London chest shoals. This latter is a bank stretching out four miles easterly from Kranya Gorka, with one, two, and three fathoms over it. At its extremity is a light vessel, with three lights, whose bearing from the toll beacon light is south by west three-quarters west, distant three miles. A mile and a half south-south-east one-half east from this is a white beacon and a broom with the branches upward. This is on the hook of the same shoal. The sand then bends to the westward, and thence runs out to Kronstadt, making the channel at that place extremely narrow. 
On the edge of the sands, on both sides, are beacons marking out their boundary. On your larboard side, you will also observe a red beacon to the southward of the toll beacon. This is placed to the south side of a shoal of 11 feet water. When you are in the fairway for Kronstadt, and it bears east by south, one half south, run on in that direction until the highest crane on Kronstadt Mole comes in one with the magazine on Kronslot, or until the fortress standing in the water is opposite to the entrance of the merchant's mole. Keep this course till you are abreast of St. John's Battery, about a mile below the town, then edge on to the northward until you open the eastern crane clear of Kronslot, then keep mid-channel, the passage here being 130 fathoms wide. Three cables length from St. John's Battery is a red flag, in four and one-half fathoms. The shoal here has from thirteen to fifteen feet water, the shoalest part bearing north-northwest one-quarter west from the flag. At the corner of Kronstadt Castle is a white flag, or beacon, within which are three fathoms, hard rocky ground. From Kronstadt to the southern channel of the river Nerva, the course is east one-half south, distant twelve miles. End of section 5section six of piloting directions for gulf of finland this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ted garvin piloting directions for the gulf of finland by john william nori section six the following extracts are from the observations on the navigation of the Baltic and Gulf of Finland to St. Petersburg, with the customs of the trade, by the commander of a British merchant ship, in the Nautical Magazine, 1841, and will be found useful to a stranger visiting St. Petersburg. So many stories are related in England, by the masters of vessels trading to Russia, of the oppression of the custom house regulations, and tyranny of the various officers in the execution of their duty, that I went to St. Petersburg very much prejudiced against the place and all connected with it. I left it, however, with a very different opinion. I can safely say that in the many countries I have visited, and amongst all the authorities I have been temporarily subjected to, I have never met with more civility and consideration than I did in Russia. I certainly treated every one I had to do business with in a civil and respectful manner, but I never gave a single rouble as a bribe, the attention, therefore, that I met with did not proceed from interested motives. A great many of the difficulties which are constantly arising to British masters of vessels and the authorities proceed, in my opinion, from both parties being ignorant of the languages. The Book of Directions, accompanied Norrie's chart of the Gulf, is very good, gives a very excellent account of the shoals, beacons, etc., and contains all that I could say on the subject. One very beneficial alteration ought, however, to be made in lighting the gulf, and I am surprised those navigating it have not already represented the matter to the Russian Admiralty. Instead of having two lights on the north end of Hoogland, I think there should only be one, and one placed on the south end of the island, the latter being a much clearer passage, more direct, and not having so many shoals in its vicinity as the north end, especially since a light was established on Rothskar, with a light on the south end of Hoogland, vessels might pass the island in all safety. On coming upwards and approaching the narrows between Sturz Uden and Dolganis, the land is plainly perceived on either side, and the shore clear. Ahead, the Toll Beacon Lighthouse will soon be perceived on the lower extremity of the island of Kronstadt, one to four miles distant from Kronstadt, carrying a blue flag at the fore. The guard ship must on no account be passed, but the vessel hove to, are anchored, just before she comes abreast of her. Any contraventions of this law, either in going up to or coming down from Kronstadt, subjects the party transgressing to a fine, which is invariably exacted. Having hove to, are anchored, close to the guard ship, her boat will soon come alongside to inquire into the health of the crew, etc. The officer, on coming on board, will sign the sound pass, demand the bills of lading in duplicate, which he will enclose in an envelope and seal with his seal, at the same time requesting the master to seal it with his. The master will also sign an acknowledgment of the possession of that of any passenger or other person on board. He must also declare whether there is any powder on board, 
If so, it must be delivered to the proper officer previous to entering the mole. It must be noticed that duplicate bills of lading are indispensably necessary, but all shipmasters coming to Kronstadt should provide themselves with a third copy, which they will find very useful in expediting the vessels being entered at the custom house. Being cleared by the guard ship, the vessel will proceed towards the mole, which is readily distinguished, keeping in the channel by observing the flags on either side, and on nearing the entrance to the mole, anchor as near as convenient. The custom house boat and officers will soon come on board, for the purpose of sealing up the hatchways, which should be previously cleared for that purpose, loose bulkheads, and any place having communication with the hold. All parcels, whether in the bills of lading or not, must be given up to be sealed. The officers will then deliver you a note, containing the number of seals placed on the vessel, and declare her at liberty to be hauled into the mole. This the mate may proceed to do, procuring, when he enters, a pilot to point out the vessel's berth, and to clear the way. It is advisable to cause the carpenter to nail small pieces of board over the seals, to prevent their being injured, as any breaking, or even defacing of them, is visited by a heavy fine. The master must now proceed to the inner guard ship, a small hulk lying inside the mole, and close to the entrance on the left hand. There you must show the sound pass, powder note, and list of crew, quantity of ballast declared, if any, etc. He will then proceed to another hulk, adjoining the one last mentioned, which is used as a sort of branch custom house, and occupied by the officers of customs, answering to our tide surveyors, etc. Then the sealed note containing bills of lading, letters, etc. must be given up. The master will then proceed to the office of J. Books, Esquire, Her Britannic Majesty's Vice Consul, and sole agent for all British vessels trading to cross that, an agent for all the merchants in St. Petersburg receiving or shipping produce in British vessels. I have never been in any country where business is conducted by British merchants in so aristocratic and exclusive a manner as in Russia. On arriving in Kronstadt, the shipmaster must put himself under the hands of one man. The merchants only acknowledge one agent. The stranger has no recourse to any other, no remedy if he feels aggrieved by the agent's conduct. I am not now alluding to the present agent, but to the system on which he acts. On the contrary, Mr. Booker, the present factotum, is a venerable and highly respectable gentleman, who has, for many years, conducted the business in such a manner as to gain almost universal satisfaction. Indeed, I never saw an establishment where business is conducted so systematically, or attended to so promptly. Mr. Booker, being also British vice-consul, has his own share of annoyances. Whenever an apprentice is chastised by his master, or a sailor turns lazy, and quarrels with the mate about his grub or his grog, they instantly appeal to Mr. Booker, whose patience, on some occasions, is very severely tried. There he will enter the vessel's name, port, etc. She is also put on a list, as in turn, for a lighter to discharge. Next proceed to the custom house, Take him with you the ship's register, list of crew, and if you have it, a third copy of bills of lading, when Mr. B.'s clerk will prepare the declaration, which must be done with care, and information for preparing which had better be obtained before arriving in port. It must contain a list of all stores, provisions, etc. on board, as well as any new or unused clothes, natural or artificial curiosities, etc., any trifling article, if at all unusual, found on board when the vessel is searched, and not inserted in the declaration, will subject the master to a heavy fine, besides the confiscation of the article. After the lapse of a few hours, the ensign must be hoisted at the main. The officers will then come on board and search the vessel. When this is done, the discharge may be commenced, so soon as a lighter can be procured. The officer on board will remove the seals from the hatchways, previous to discharging, and every day on the discharge being finished, the vessel will be visited by the proper officer, who will seal up all again. In discharging or loading from lighters, where hatchways are sealed up, never permit any of the crew to break the seals. This must only be done by the proper officer, otherwise the vessel will be subject to a heavy fine. The vessel being discharged by hoisting the engine at the fore, the clearing officer will come on board. A strict search is now made. The declaration formerly made at the custom house produced, and everything on board is expected to correspond with it. 
if there was a greater quantity of wine, cigars, spirits, or other stores on board than the law allows, they will be removed to the custom house stores under seal. At any future period, if a supply is wanted, it can, without any difficulty, be procured by getting an order from the officer in the floating custom house. The ship being ready to receive cargo, a note will be sent on board by the agent, stating that a lighter is arrived, her number, etc. The master or mate will then proceed to the floating custom house and request the docket for the goods, called a yearlick, which, being first entered in a book, and that book signed by the receiver, is delivered. The craft may then go alongside the vessel, and when ready to discharge, an officer must be procured from the floating custom house to take off the seals from the lighter's hatchway. Should the cargo come down in a barge, or cutter, as they are called, the yearlick will be procured at the same time as before named, and on being taken to the officer stationed at the booms, between the vessel and the landing place, will be signed by him. The craft may then proceed alongside, and discharge, without further ceremony. A few days before the vessel is loaded, request the agent to procure this outward pass from St. Petersburg. Without this precaution, the vessel may be delayed when otherwise ready for sea. When loaded, take all the yearlicks for the cargo, as well as the provision yearlick, which will have been procured on arrival from the agent's clerk to enable the vessel's stores to be taken on board, and proceed to the floating custom house. Then a manifest will be made out, which, when ready, will be carried to the agent's office. Bills of lading must now be signed, and the cash account settled with the cash keeper, which being done, the pass and manifest will be carried to the clerk at the custom house, when, the trifling duties exacted on the ship's stores being paid, in about two hours the pass will be delivered. It must then be taken to the floating custom house, where its contents are entered in a book, thence taken to the inner guard ship, and signed by the captain of the port, which being done, the vessel is at liberty to haul out and proceed to sea. On approaching the outer guard ship, care must be taken to heave to in time, when the pass is signed by the officer, sail may be made for Elsinore, where, on arrival, the pass, bills of lading, etc., being taken on shore, the vessel will soon be cleared for her destination. End of section 6 Section 7 of Piloting Directions for Gulf of Finland This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Piloting Directions for the Gulf of Finland by John William Norrie. Section 7. Regulations and Orders Published by Order of the Russian Admiralty. Merchant vessels going to Kronstadt at night must strictly observe not to pass the guard ship, but to anchor near to her. This is always a frigate lying at anchor in the fairway, about three or four miles from Kronstadt, and may be known by her carrying a light in the main top. All foreign merchant ships, though well armed, passing by a Russian cruiser or castle, must strike their topsails. Footnote: This is the original notice, but of late such has not been strictly observed. Hoisting their colours in general suffices. End footnote. And if any should refuse to do so, they are to fire a gun at him, for which shot such master shall be obliged to pay a ducat, and if he should still offer to resist, then they shall fire at him again, and for the second shot he shall be obliged to pay three ducats. All foreign ships coming from sea must steer up directly to our cruisers and stop in order to receive from them these instructions, and must not offer to pass by them upon any pretense whatever. If any should offer to pass by, our cruisers are to fire at them, and for every shot they will be obliged to pay a ducat. They must also receive on board a pilot from the cruisers, and if any offer to sail without a pilot, they shall be compelled to pay fifteen dollars. If any person should sail without a pilot, and chance to run upon any of His Majesty's ships, and damage the same, he will be obliged to make all the losses good, to the full value unless it happen in time of storm, and not through the master's negligence. In such case he shall be free from all penalty. As soon as the master comes to anchor, or fastens his ship at the appointed place, he is immediately to deliver, if he has one, a list of the names of all his ship's crew 
and passengers, as also an account of the cargo, to the officers who shall come and require the same of him, without any concealment, upon penalty of a forfeit, according to the sea laws of Russia. No foreign vessels shall lie upon their own anchors in the road of Kronstadt, but must be made fast to the anchors of one fluke, which are laid for that purpose, from St. John's Battery, for half a verse distance above the man-of-war's haven. Nota bene, to act according to the above article, when the anchors are laid. The masters of merchant ships, before they come with their ships into the haven, must unload their powder and other combustible things, at the place appointed for the same, whence they can take it on board again when ready to depart. The vessels which are loaded with unslacked lime must keep themselves at a great distance from other ships, neither must they offer to approach or come near or fasten to any of the ships, but must be unloaded in a safe and secure place, upon penalty of confiscation of the ship and goods, and corporal punishment of the master, according to the crime. Foreign ships must not lie between Kronslot and the man of war's haven without very great necessity and if by a calm or contrary winds they should be obliged to come to an anchor, they must stay no longer than they can, and either by warping or sails bring the ships a quarter of a mile, or farther, past the man of wars haven to the eastward or westward of Kronslot, as they shall find most convenient, but never to lie near the man of wars haven. Foreigners must not offer to come nearer or enter our forts, storehouses or the men of war's haven upon any pretence whatsoever even of repairing their ships but if any one shall have occasion for anything then such must apply to the commander-in-chief or to the captain of the port who is to supply all foreigners with what they shall have occasion for according to their desire without any hindrance they paying money for the same foreigners are forbidden on this side the birch islands to kronstadt and st petersburg as also in the river to throw out their ballast except in places appointed for the same which shall be shown them by the captain of the port and masters are obliged to order their men to have always in readiness two tubs or baskets on board wherein they must put all dirt and sweepings from the deck between decks and in the hold in order to be carried ashore and emptied in the places appointed for the same and if any should be found to act contrary to this such masters shall be obliged to pay, for every shovelful thrown out, one hundred dollars for the first time, and for the second time the ship will be confiscated. The same is to be understood of all havens, rivers, roads, and all the ports belonging to the Empire of Russia. If any foreign master with his anchors should happen to draw out any anchors or cables that have been lost by Russians or foreigners, he must immediately acquaint the captain of the port of the same, for which he shall have the third part of the value thereof, and if it prove of no use, it will be restored to him that found it, but if any should conceal the same, and afterwards be discovered, then he will not only be obliged to restore the same, but likewise to pay double what it costs when new. All masters and other commanders of vessels, upon arrival in this port, are obliged to go to the captain of the port to get vessels for the unloading of their ballast, and, for as many lasts of ballast as shall be unloaded out of the vessels, to pay half a dollar, or sixty-two and a half kopecks, Russian money, for each last, that is to say, to pay for no more lasts than are really found at unloading of the vessels, and at the appointed places. Masters of ships must unload their ballast into the vessels appointed for that purpose with their own men, and must let down a sailcloth into the vessel wherein they unload the same that none of it may drop into the water, upon penalty of paying twenty-one dollars. When unloaded, the said vessels, with the ballast, must be carried to the appointed places by their own men, where it and the vessels are to be received by the custom-house servants, and by them to be unloaded, and neither the masters of the ships nor their men are to be obliged to unload the ballast out of these vessels. It is forbidden for masters of all sorts of vessels to unload ballast, without notice being first given to the captain of the port, upon penalty of ten dollars, but masters must first acquaint the captain of the port, whose duty it is to show the place where the ballast must be unloaded, and they must likewise be informed by the said captain from what place they are to take their ballast when wanted. 
it is also forbidden to unload the ballast at night under the penalty of one hundred dollars if the merchantmen should have occasion for vessels to unload their ballast they must demand them from the captain of the port who has orders to let them be hired to the merchants for half a dollar per last and if any other particular persons are willing to undertake such a work with their own vessels they are likewise to receive for their labour half a dollar per last all masters of merchant vessels lying at an anchor in the ports and roads where there are none of the one fluked anchors must have at their anchors boys and boy tops and all masters not regarding this article must pay twenty dollars ships drawing above eight feet of water english measure must not come up to st petersburg but lie at anchor in the merchant's haven by kronstadt to unload so much of their cargo till they be lightened to eight feet water as above when masters of ships are loading and unloading their cargo at that time nobody must smoke tobacco either above or below the decks nor in the hold no pitch or tar must be boiled in the cook-room and in the evening betwixt eight and nine o'clock the fire must be extinguished if the captain desires in the night-time to have a candle or a lamp lighted in his cabin he is to have it on a flat candlestick filled up with water that no bad accidents may happen therefrom as for pitch or tar it must be boiled ashore in a boat or float all commanders of foreign vessels coming into this port having passengers on board must give notice of the same to the admiralty college and in other ports they are to acquaint him who is appointed by the said college and if any passengers have a desire to be carried by them from russia they are not to be received on board for passage without first acquainting the college of admiralty upon the penalty of fifty dollars and if any should knowingly offer to carry away any malefactor he is liable to suffer the same punishment as such malefactor did deserve and the ship shall be confiscated as also if any should offer to carry away any prisoner of war his ship likewise will be confiscated masters are obliged to give strict charge to their men that everything appertaining to them may be duly performed in their absence from the ships because by that they cannot excuse themselves in case their men should do anything contrary to these regulations and must be answerable for all as being commanders of the ships when foreign sailors do anything contrary to these regulations without the knowledge of their set masters and the said masters by these regulations being obliged to pay the penalty for the same acquittances will be given for money received for an offence committed by their men and not by the said masters by which receipt they may be enabled to recover the same with satisfaction in their own country the following regulations have been published at st petersburg from the department of foreign trade to the customs of st petersburg one whereas a detention very frequently occurs at some ports during the shipment of russian goods in consequence of the observance of an existing custom that the usual routine of business is not followed up on sundays and holidays and complaints have been made in consequence further that occasionally masters of vessels and the proprietors of goods render themselves liable to be fined by neglecting to make entry or declaration of goods within the prescribed period when the arrival of the vessel has occurred during the forenoon of or evening of a holiday or the time limited by law for making such entry or report expires on a holiday in consequence whereof this department has resolved that business shall likewise proceed in its accustomary course on sundays and holidays when the captains or owners of the goods are desirous that such should be the case two whereas complaints have been made to the department for foreign trade on account of the tardiness with which the shipment of goods is carried into effect which is attended with detriment to the shipper of the same as well as to the masters of the vessels and further that it occasionally occurs during the autumn vessels which have still had time to proceed to sea had they been provided with declarations of the goods loaded from st petersburg but in consequence of the non-receipt of the gocket or clearance of payment they could not be fully laden and therefore have been obliged to winter at kronstadt in order to prevent such an occurrence the department orders that the department for russian goods to be shipped in kronstadt on the manifesto of the lighters shall keep an account of the quantity laden in each vessel in the meantime but after the completion of the shipment of these goods to finish the charging of the customs imposts in order that the vessels may be enabled after the following transmission of the cockets or clearance to take their departure and leave the harbour without being delayed 
and sufficiently early to set sail. When, however, a detention takes place in dispatching the cockets or clearances, in consequence of the communication being interrupted, which, in the meantime, should not occur without important reasons, in such cases the vessels shall not be detained. But, upon a computation having been made of the requisite dues to the customs, security shall be given in Kronstadt by the agent there, until the final adjustment of matters is effected. 3. Several captains of merchant vessels have made complaints that they have been treated with too much severity on account of trifling matters. If such has sometimes been the case, it was contrary to the intention of the Supreme Board of Administration, or through some misunderstanding. The authorities have doubtless in view the checking of smuggling as much as possible, but they never intended that undue severity should be exercised. The Board will therefore take the necessary measures to prevent such inconveniences in future. End of Section 7 End of Piloting Directions for the Gulf of Finland by J. W. Norrie